Okay, ooh, I see him in the chat. Good afternoon. We shall continue into module number four. As always, there is a do I know this? Be sure to knock that out ahead of starting through the lecture content. Because if you know this stuff, then, you know, not really the point in going through it all. You just take the chapter review and do the labs and move forward. Okay. This module is cut in two with the first part being all about wired based vulnerabilities and then wireless vulnerabilities. Now, yes, some of these vulnerabilities will apply to both like this one, uh, but we're thinking uh, we're putting them in, in the two categories just as, as a way to have a flow for the conversation. So for example, network-based vulnerability number one is the Network Basic Input Output System, otherwise known as NetBIOS, along with its partner, the Link Local Multicast Name Resolution, or LLMNR. These two protocols are primarily used by Windows for host identification. Uh, the second, LLMNR, allows hosts on the same local link to perform name resolution for other hosts. Things that you need to know. NetBIOS has three services, NetBIOS NS, DGM, and SSN. NS is the name service, DGM is datagram distribution service, and SSN is session service. You need to know NetBIOS has those three services. It also uses the following ports, TCP 135, UDP-137, UDP-138, TCP-139, and TCP-445. There are many vulnerabilities for NetBIOS, Service Message Block, or SMB, and LLMNR. For example, a lot of users never change their work group. They keep it to the standard work group. That helps us in starting to identify ways to get in because we know that that exists so we can use that as a credible part in our attack. Weak credentials, as always, for file and printer sharing. It is possible to spoof or poison LLMNR authoritative sources using ports like UDP uh, 30, uh, 5355 and UDP 137. Tools such as Metasploit and Puppy are useful to tackle these services. In specifically, specifically talking about SMB. SMB is a Windows historically vulnerable protocol. It is what was used for Eternal Blue from the NSA. That is what led to the success of WannaCry and Netya and not Netya and all those others, uh, those are the ransomwares. Because people had SMB facing out to the world, uh, it is historically vulnerable, and like specifically with WannaCry and SMB, the patch for it came out months before WannaCry hit the world and hit the world hard, only because people weren't patching. Next on our item is DNS. DNS servers should be protected. DNS servers should be regarded as a high target. Are they always secured? No, not always. So as pen testers, your goal would be to get into the DNS server and manipulate the resolver cache through injections or corrupted DNS data so that DNS server sends the wrong IP address to victims and redirecting them to wherever you want. Oops. Uh, like I said, DNS servers need to be protected. Though that is critical infrastructure that should not be, uh, that should not be easily compromised. 
But more often than not, people will just set up the DNS server with things like Active Directory and never go in there and make some changes. Another is the simple network management protocol. Just like DNS, a lot of people just set it and forget it. It is possible to enumerate SNMP devices to see if they're using default SNMP passwords. And surprise, surprise, a lot of them have default SNMP credentials. They'll either have a weak or the default info. Tools like Nmap can be used to gather information and brute force these devices. I mean, come on, MD5 for authentication, you can do better. The simple mail transport protocol, another uh, that needs to be on the list. The quick refresher for their ports are TCP 25, 465, 587, 110, 995, and 143. Oh, and 993. Any SMTP open relays are beautiful targets to send spoofed email, spam, phishing, and others. Because their job as open relays is to get whatever information comes in and blast it out to the main SMTP server so it looks like it's valid. Commands that you should be familiar with for this protocol are things like the hello, the backwards hello, the start TLS, RCPT, uh, the receipt, data, reset, mail, quit, help, auth, uh, verify, and XPN should be disabled. And I say should because they probably won't be. So thus far, you should be familiar with NetBIOS and what ports exist uh, with NetBIOS, SMB, and LLMNR, what ports exist with them and their vulnerabilities. You should be well aware of how DNS works and how DNS servers work. And uh, so you know how to secure them and or penetrate. SNMP. You should be able to use Nmap in order to gather information and possibly brute force should uh, the, the device be set with a weak or default credentials. And SNMP or uh, SMTP, sorry. Especially if there's any open relays, those are prime targets. If I'm going too fast, please say so. Uh, next will be the file transfer protocol. Legacy FTP doesn't use encryption at all. So your best practice will either be using the file transfer protocol secure, which with SSH, or the secure file transfer protocol, SFTP, with TLS, and using hashing algorithms from the SHA-2 family. Like with most of the things that, that we talk about, you have your basic best practices, like using strong passwords and multi-factor authentication, using least privilege principle, using encryption at rest, locking down administrator accounts, keep software up to date, uh, use validated encryption ciphers, keep back end databases on different servers in FTP and require re Reauthentication of inactive services. Wireshark can only extract files from FTP if they're going through in plain text. Wireshark cannot handle anything encrypted unless you have the private key. But that's not to say that people are using either of these two secure forms of FTP. Most people won't. So it's up to you as pen testers to find when a when your client is using an insecure FTP and leverage that to get in.
Next, we have pass the hash. Since most, if not all, of Windows uh, FTP over SSH is the first, FTPS. Uh, since all Windows versions store password as hashes in the SAM file, the OS doesn't necessarily know the plain text password, but it calculates what you enter into Windows and uh, matches it with what it has on file. It is possible to extract that hash without knowing what the password is and just use that to log into another system. Your tool of choice for this will be Mimikatz. So as an attacker, you do not need to have the, the plain text password. As long as you can get the hash, you can use that to log in because Windows is stupid and uh, it, it's only matching hashes. So as long as you have the right hash, it lets you in. Kerberos and LDAP or the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Oops, a quick recap on how uh, the Kerberos system works. It's a six step process. Oh, uh, the system doesn't include a time code. No, it doesn't. Windows doesn't. Windows is dumb. Uh, the six steps for Kerberos. Client sends a request to the authentication server within the KDC. Here's step one, sends the request. Step two, the authentication server, this guy, sends a session key and a ticket granting ticket that is used to verify the client's identity. Step three, that client sends that ticket granting ticket to the ticket granting server. Step four, this server generates and sends a ticket back to the client. Now with that ticket from step four, that is used to present to the server and the server then sees that it's a legit ticket that came from here. So it grants the client access. Windows Active Directory uses LDAP as an access protocol with Kerberos for authentication. One of the most common attacks is the Kerberos golden ticket attack, manipulating Kerberos ticket based on available hashes from earlier. If the system is part of a donate, uh, domain, the attacker can use the Kerberos TGT password hash to get the golden ticket. Your tool of choice is Empire. Similarly, there is the silver ticket, forging tickets, uh, service tickets for a given service on a particular server, like Windows Common Internet File System, the Windows Management Instrumentation, uh, logging on as a system account, using security identifiers, the FQDN, and the given service. So it is possible to log in as another user. It is also possible to log in as a service using the tools mentioned. These tools you should become familiar with. So I would suggest taking time to learn how to use Mimikatz, to learn how to use Empire, uh, Nmap, and so on. These will be useful when you are out in the field. A quick review from CIS 75. You also have your traditional man in the middle, placing yourself between your victim, and uh, between two victims and catching all the traffic that's coming in and out. Uh, it is possible to infect the local network with an ARP poison to intercept traffic. You could also manipulate the network 
with spanning tree protocol if it's being used by a root switch, thereby being able to see all traffic. A layer three, man in the middle, can be achieved with a rogue router on the network and trick other routers to believe the rogue has the shortest or the better path. You can use the tool SSL strip to achieve this with HTTPS traffic. Uh, once again, best practices that sadly haven't propagated out everywhere. Things like selecting an unused VLAN other than one as your native VLAN for any trunks. Administratively configuring switch ports as access ports. That way a user can't negotiate a trunk or disable trunk negotiation. Limit the number of MAC addresses learned on a given port so that things like R poisoning doesn't work. Control spanning tree to stop users or unknown devices from manipulating BD, uh, BPDU guard or other features like it. Turning off the Cisco discovery protocol for networks that don't require it. Uh, new switches should all have ports assigned to a parking lot, quote unquote, VLAN until they're used using root guard, uh, using dynamic address resolution protocol inspection, uh, using IP source guard, DHCP snooping to prevent rogue DHCP servers, using storm control and access control lists. These are all ways to fight man in the middle. These are all ways as pen testers that you need to overcome with a lot of these probably not implemented, but if they are, you need to have an idea on how to overcome these. Next, we have the downgrade attacks, forcing a user to use an outdated, uh, outdated protocol or outdated weak encryption. The easy way to fix this is remove the capability for devices to use weaker technologies. So something like TLS 1.2, that's not easy to man in the middle. SSL 3, that has been exposed. If you take that out, if you take TLS 1.0 and you keep to the latest two, for example, you'll prevent your server from downgrading further uh, you know, into vulnerable status. BGP hijacking is the most common of the router manipulation attacks. An attacker configures or compromises an edge router to announce prefixes that have been assigned to the organization that haven't been assigned. If the announcement contains a route that is more specific than, than the legitimate, the victim's traffic could be redirected to that attacker. BGP is horribly insecure, yet it's being used as the backbone for the internet. We have had recent attacks by using BGP. Check out the news, be aware of these types of attacks. They're not going away anytime soon because a, a lot of infrastructure still uses BGP. In the denial of service world, we have quite a number. We have our traditional direct denial of service, a device generating packets regardless of protocol or application sending directly to the victim. This is an example of a sin flood attack. It is more of an annoyance. The server isn't necessarily down, but it's 
too busy to answer legitimate requests, so it looks like it's down. There are, though, other DOS attacks that exploit vulnerabilities such as buffer overflows that can cause servers or even infrastructure to crash. Those are obviously more fatal than just a simple sin flood that just you know is an annoyance to you. There's also the distributed flavor, distributed denial of service attack. This can be getting a number of systems together, including IoT devices who are normally insecure and putting them together through a command and control server to attack a victim. And this could be done with things like the sin flood attack or uh, spamming emails if it's an email server or other activities. There's the sneakier reflected DDoS attack. An attacker will send a spoofed packet that appears from the victim, which causes the victim to respond to the intended target. In this way, it seems that the attack is coming from one machine rather than the attackers. You will see this usually with UDP since there is no handshake to verify the packets. So you see in this picture, we have the source IP of 10.1.2.3, which is this guy, or the destination of 1.1.1.8, which is this guy. So the packet arrives here. This guy responds back to that source IP, which is actually this way. If the attacker can get a number of systems to do this same thing, that is a large reflected DDoS attack. How do you track that the original packet came from the attacker when the packet itself has an interesting source and destination? You can do this kind of stuff with Scapy. Scapy allows you to create any form of packet of any protocol of any type. So it is possible using Scapy to generate this kind of packet send that off to a host and see this in action. Security cameras should be connected on a different network. So the question is, should security cameras be connected via TCP so it's harder for someone to spoof the RSTP packets and blind the camera? Secure, uh, security cameras should all just be on a separate network, not connected out to the internet. Because that's the thing, uh, most cameras are insecure. So their communication will cut just, you know, just be plain text or have a very weak security. Right, if someone plugs a device between the camera and the NVR, then they could see the, the traffic. But most people will put the camera in the same network as all their other devices. Here is another form of a DDoS. Amplification. This form is a response is uh, in which the response traffic sent by the unwitting participant is larger than those initially sent by the by the attacker. So again, manipulating packets, the attacker sends a spoof packet of sixty four bytes, and the large response comes in at three thousand, overwhelming the actual victim.
all these things are occurring in the wild. Um, speaking of networks, we have the network access control. The idea sounds nice by going by the fingerprints of the devices, the MAC addresses, we can ensure that uh, the right device is connecting to our network. But MAC addresses are very easy to spoof. So a legitimate device, we can clone that MAC address and use that to log in. We'll be able to get onto the network easily with uh, uh, by just spoofing the MAC address. As long as we know the MAC address of one of the devices that is on the network, we can overcome this. Piece of cake. It is possible to hop VLANs, which is why I suggested earlier with the cameras to be on a whole separate network because it is possible to hop VLANs. It occurs through, through two methods, switch spoofing and double tagging. In switch spoofing, an attack imitates a trunking switch by sending the respective VLAN tag and the specific trunking protocols. Once again, the best practice against this is similar to ARP poisoning. Double tagging, as you see here, occurs when an attacker changes the original 802.1 Q frame and adds two VLAN tags, an outer tag with his VLAN and an inner tag of the victim's VLAN. So when the double tag reaches the switch, it'll process the outer tag and forward the frame to the port belonging to that native VLAN. And then that frame is forwarded to reach the next switch that'll reach the victim. Just because you have VLAN set up doesn't mean life is all safe now. Because it is completely possible to use, again, tool like Scapy to create these kinds of packets that have two layers of double tagging and be able to circumvent any VLANs, especially if you're using a very easy to figure out VLAN scheme, which is why earlier, again, it was suggested to, to not use any default uh, setups for VLAN. You know, this is pretty common that the main axis is VLAN one and uh, another VLAN is a even number like 10 any of the multiples of 10 are tend to be used like 10, 20, 30, 100, you know, it, it's not rocket science to figure that out unless you use odd numbers, you know, numbers that aren't, are not commonly used for VLANs. Um, this should actually say DHCP, not DNS. Um, yes, the security through obscurity is that has been debunked. But anywho, uh, the two most prevalent attacks against DHCP is starvation and spoofing. In starvation, an attacker broadcasts a large number of DHCP request messages with spoofed source MAC addresses. If the DHCP server responds to all these fake requests, available IP addresses in the scope are depleted, and that could be within a few minutes to a few seconds. Once that is achieved, the attacker can set up a rogue DHCP server and start re responding to the new requests from the legitimate system since the real one is down because it ran out of space, so it can't uh, it can't handle new requests.
Any questions so far? Okay, we are halfway through. Moving on to wireless. Your first item that you need to watch out for is rogue access points. The most simplistic of the wireless based attacks. An attacker installs a rogue access point in your network to fool users to connect to that access point, creating a backdoor and obtaining access to the network and its systems. So you have your legitimate AP, your legitimate SSID, and then somebody else sets up another one nearby and gets your users to connect to it, thus circumventing everything that you've set up. This is, this is successful because in comparison to wire, wireless can be anywhere. Your network boundary is really a blur with wireless. With wired, it is very straightforward. As long as you're connected to the wire, you're in. Otherwise, you're not. But with wireless, you can be outside the building. You could be in the parking lot. You could be on the street. And with a, a sensitive enough antenna, be able to connect or trick others to connect as in the case with an evil twin. An evil twin is configured exactly as the existing network. The attacker then uses DNS spoofing to redirect victims into a cloned captive portal or a website and through that inject malware and collect credentials. Some ways that you can figure this out are with packet filtering cryptographic protocols, spoofing detections to see if and when things like this are happening. And I keep doing that when I wanna go down here in my notes. There's de-authentication. Attackers can use legitimate wireless clients to, uh, to de-authenticate from legitimate APs on wireless routers and then either perform a denial of service condition or make those clients connect to an evil twin. One way to avoid this is 802.11w standard for the management frame protection feature. Tools to watch out for in this realm are things like the Ponegachi and the Flipper. These two are built to de-authenticate legitimate uh, users and watch the traffic as they reconnect and gather enough of that information to figure out the, uh, the SSID passwords to get in. It is also possible for attackers to listen to the client's request for their preferred network make a list of those and impersonate those networks to get the clients to connect to them. The tool that does this easily is the Wi-Fi Pineapple. This is why a best practice is when you leave your home, when you uh, are out and about, you turn off Wi-Fi on your phone because as you are outside of your network, your device starts sending beacons asking for the, uh, the Wi-Fi access points that it knows. Those can be collected since they're happening over the air and completely unencrypted. Those can be collected and then relayed back. The Wi-Fi Pineapple does a really good job of making that very easy for anybody to be out and about with it listen for those, those SSID beacons, collect them and replay them saying, oh yeah, that's me. I am your home network, connect to me. And a lot of devices because of the protocol and the way that 802.11 is set up, they will connect to it. Because they look, it has the right SSID, 
It looks like what I'm looking for, therefore I'll connect. There's also, um, oh, yeah. So speaking of wireless, we have WEP, WPA, and WPA2. Um, WEP should not be used anywhere. I don't know of anybody who's using it. And if you know of anybody who's using it, tell them to stop. It has been broken for quite some time. This technology is obsolete and should be avoided at all costs. Now WPA and WPA2, they are susceptible to different vulnerabilities. Uh, WPA3 is supposed to be the savior for these vulnerabilities, but all of them have uh, different authentication methods, including PSK. WPA is not susceptible to the, uh, to the IV attacks that affect web, uh, which were uh, in web, you would take the IVs that are coming out, the initialization vectors that are coming out from a device, from two devices, and you put them together, you get enough of them together to figure out the code. To uh, not figure out the code, but figure out the password. And uh, Aircrack actually did a great job of just running it, watching it collect enough IVs together, and it would figure out the password. WPA isn't susceptible to that, but it is possible to capture the four way handshake between a client, a station, and the access point. And, uh, to collect that info uh, to break it. Aircrack NG can still get through the WPA four-way handshake. Here you kind of see the way that it is done. WPA2 for the longest was safe until the crack vulnerability came out. It broke WPA2 and caused quite the ripple effect across the world. As of right now, if you have WPA2 on your wireless network, you are not fully secure because this vulnerability crack works the key reinstallation attack. It basically, during the four-way handshake, it changes the key uh, to all zeros, rendering the communication in plain text. This is why we're all waiting for devices to come out with WPA3, uh, which also means if you have a, a laptop, You'll need to buy a new laptop because uh, since when has wireless cards been modular, especially in modern laptops, everything's all soldered on together. Oops. Uh, there's also a few others in that realm, uh, like the Karma attack, which is uh, Karma attacks radio machines automatically. It's a man in the middle for rogue uh, APs. There's also the fragmentation attack that was used against web, which again, should be using web to begin with. Uh, and there's also credential harvesting. That can be uh, through phishing attacks, impersonating access points, using captive portals like MageCart or using websites to get information out. Um, firmware updates have helped, but not every device gets firmware updates. There's a lot of, of uh, prosumer devices that don't get updated anymore.
So although yes, firmware updates would be the answer, not every vendor keeps up with all their all their prosumer devices, leaving a lot of people, especially at home, vulnerable. I don't know if something like, like Intel will update for WPA3. I mean, the last time that we got an update from WPA to WPA2, you had to get a new card. But we'll see. We shall see. Because it's also coming out at the same time with um, with the new 802.11 that um, who the last two letters are slipping my mind right now. Yes, APs do get firmware updates, but only for a limited time. Just like any other device that we have, they're only supported for so long before they switch over and, you know, because they have a new product, because again, they need to make money. And if, if companies sold you one device that could always update, they're not going to make money off of that. Ah, yes, Wi Fi 6. Yes, that should be uh, with WPA3. Good questions. Um, in the world of Bluetooth, similar rules apply. If you are not using Bluetooth, turn it off. Uh, your two main items in uh, for Bluetooth would be blue jacking and blue snarfing. Blue jacking compromises attackers or compromises blah, 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 blah. comprises of attackers sending unsolicited spam messages to a victim over Bluetooth. So kind of like DOS that it's more of an annoyance. Blue snarfing is the attack to steal information rather than spam messages. For that, you need tools like the blue snarfer. And of course you need a device that has Bluetooth and can uh, transmit manipulated packets. And while we're talking about uh, wireless, there is also RFID. You have the low frequency and the high frequency RFIDs. Low frequency works at length of under three feet, whereas high frequency will work between three and 10 feet. There is also the ultra high frequency who operates up to 30 feet. RFID is silent, so it is possible to use readers to spoof information and steal. This is why there's a lot of, of um, like wallets or backpacks that are shielded to prevent RFID scans. Not so much a problem right now that a lot of us are uh, socially distanced and, uh, and staying home, but once life returns to normal, this will be a issue again. That sounds like RFID. If a card has to come within range and is red, it might be RFID. Worth a check. And there are toys that you could use to listen for RFID and copy that 
uh, copy those packets and replay them back in the air and then open things like those gates. Unfortunately, we are not in person. Otherwise, uh, I actually have two, two uh, of those sets where you could go out and about and uh, listen for an RFID uh, signal, copy it, and be able to replay it back to things like open doors. Uh, the a specific device. I know that from what I've heard, uh, Flipper can do it. And Flipper is actually supposed to be able to do a number of devices with add-ons. I know the Ponagachi does not do it. Uh, what is that? What is my little toy? Where is it? Ow. It is by uh, Rice Corp. Oh, the name of this guy is slipping me. Oh, the Proxmark Pro, there it is. Oh, sure. This guy. I have two of these at the, at Cabrillo that once, once we're back in person, you could use to see um, you know, if you if you see any RFID, you're able to replicate, and it can handle both the low frequency and high frequencies. I might be able to read as long as it's RFID. It is possible to read. It's a pretty awesome tool. I, I have played with it, tested it out. It works on the college. And it also handles NFC. Pretty, pretty fun tool. I know it's 200 bucks. Um, but like I said, I have to whenever, you know, whenever we're back in person.